the stability control engineers were essentially designing this hand that was going to grab your car when you got in trouble and yeah. represent the ba the best driver in the world to respond to your mistake. But a lot of them couldn't drive themselves, so I would use that kind of disconnect to sell to, to the manufacturers car control uh, classes for those engineers and he wanted to test he wanted the, his guys to be exposed to things that were out of the box mm -hmm. but that was the whole point was yeah. to kind of take things out of the box so some of those programs didn't work as well as others the, the military programs were awesome yeah I mean you'd, you'd be doing night vision uh, pursuits and using left foot braking to aim an imaginary turret that's on the car which is interesting because the ice is black and yeah. the snow is green and so traction basically was green. You'd just try to put the tires on the green bits. I am amazed. How fun is that, right? From inside the Moto Man studio, these are extraordinary stories of ordinary folks and how they became the people shaping the car world, the tech world, and our future. You guys have all heard the story before. The kid that was practically born into racing. Started out in diapers and go-karts, had the incredibly good fortune of a race obsessed father to help him overcome the odds to become the Lewis Hamiltons of the world. But what happens if you were born into a military family and you're always moving around? Or instead of going around a track, you prefer going sideways? Or most challenging, your skills are better suited to a race series that hadn't even been invented yet. That was all true for today's guest, Tanner Faust, but instead of growing up in the backyard of McLaren or Marinello, he grew up in a place where Subarus were king, and this was before the WRX days, and his first exposure to a somewhat interesting car was a Porsche that really wasn't all that fast. Not too many people are familiar with the 912E, but it was one of the first electronic fuel injected cars. Mm -hmm. um, it was made just for the American market. They didn't sell it over anywhere else. Um, meaning, and if you remember what the Germans thought of us in the 70s, they thought that we drove really slow, that we actually couldn't drive. They would have just made it automatic if they could. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, they did have an automatic three-speed version. But it's, uh, it's a pretty slow car. It's got a four-cylinder instead of a six. You know, it's a 912 mm -hmm. um, with the electronic fuel injection that didn't really work. And uh, it is, um, I still have it. That car your dad bought when you were three. Mm -hmm. and. No offense, man, here, but you're kind of like a grandpa in the drift world. Yeah, so in the drift this, world for sure. This car has been around probably 40 years of your life. Yeah, yeah, no, it was in the garage. I mean, I, I grew up with this car, right? So this was the car that I. Uh, okay, I'm a little I, man. I grew up on Chevys and Buicks, and you grew up on a Porsche. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I would mow the lawn just so that I could move the car to get the lawnmower <laughs> out. And the, the car had been used against me in that way a okay. lot, you know. Was, everybody knew that I was addicted That's to That's a great parenting car. style. Right? <laughs> yeah. um, that was the moment I remember uh, thinking this car stuff is kind of cool yeah. and really starting to pay attention. And then I turned into that kid that was the annoying one in the group that always pointed out when some car drove by mm -hmm. or would guess the car by the sound or by the headlights or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it was a family game. Actually, I could I could pick most cars by their headlights when I was six, which paid off when you're trying to look, you know, to see if police cars were coming towards you at night. <laughs> okay. Which I know you know what I'm talking I, about. Yeah. You know, let's just say I played that game very well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but at some point, I discovered that there were other people like that that just talked cars all day and and had all the posters that I had and had this. And in Denver, the there were people like this. Magazines. Well, I didn't find them until I was in college. You could imagine, because Denver, it's like a, there's a, a state law, you must drive a Subaru. Yeah, it's, so my dad was staying, was in Denver, my mom was in Monterey, mm -hmm. and she had an old Volvo that the uh, windows would like almost rattle. A 240 or a 740? It was a, it was a 240, 240 wagon. Nice. And uh, you could always tell when she hit 70, because the windows would just start shaking and the thing. <laughs> yeah, something you don't have come. We both grew up on Volvos. Oh. I like them apples. Yeah. OK, so Monterey. Monterey, and then she married a military guy there. And she was at the Navy Postgraduate School as yes. a computer programmer, and uh, which was a pretty small industry at that time. And then uh, she married uh, my stepfather, and we immediately went to Scotland. Uh, it, way out in the sticks. And in how old were you at this point? I was nine. There we had a Volkswagen bus. That was the first car that I really drove, was yeah. a Volkswagen bus, 76 maybe. And um, and we lived in this farmhouse out in the middle of nowhere. And it was actually awesome because by 10 I could drive all the cars, um, I could drive stick. I remember coming back thinking 
that the the American kids that I knew, a lot of them I knew back in California. We moved back to Napa, mm -hmm. California. Um, Man, you live in good places. That's yeah, that very lucky. Monterey, places. Napa, yeah. Denver. I mean, these are good places. These are really good places. Um, but I remember thinking that it really was a cultural experience because when you're over there, mm -hmm. it's really easy just to travel around. We used to take the seats out of the bus, mm -hmm. uh, put sleeping bags, and we do road trips through Europe. We take a ferry over the Netherlands from Scotland. Oh yeah. And uh, just do road trips through there. And, you know, kids, you don't get to do that. I had been driving until I was 13 mm. and all of a sudden came to the U.S. and had to wait three years to get a license. And that was a frustrating three years. All my older brothers and sisters were getting their driver's licenses. Yeah. And, and I had driven way more than they had. And they were legal to drive. So it was, it was a good... And you were probably the better driver. Um, for well, you know, of course, I was a 13 year old kid in my mind's eye, I was, yeah. but yeah, you, you were know. a race car driver at that point already, for sure, right? <laughs> yeah, and then June 13th, 16th birthday, the you know, the make it or break it day, which wait a minute, your birthday is June 13th, third. Okay, so you and I grew up on Volvos, mm -hmm. we raced RC cars, and our birthdays are eight days apart. And did yeah. you, uh, what RC cars did you race? You said? I did Tamayas. Yeah, Tamayas. Yeah. yeah. And so you stopped racing right about the time the RC10 came out. Basically, yeah. Right, yeah. So you, you remember then when your birthday came around, that was a big day. It was a huge day. Like man. you had, literally, you were standing next to the phone, you had to um, make your appointment uh -huh. for your driver's test. And, you know, my sister had failed like four times. You'd uh -huh. asked every person. You just absolutely interviewed every single person that had taken the test. And where did you go? What did mm -hmm. you do? What turns did you? Did you have to parallel park? Blah, blah, blah. And to add a little, and first of all, the driving uh, education experience, how mm -hmm. pitiful was that? Oh, well, I kind of cheated because I went, I lived, I grew up in New York, but I got my driver's license in Vermont because you can get it in Europe. Here. I like it. That is yeah, awesome. Yeah, that was good, man. <laughs> uh, in California at the time, you did six months of simulator. What? Simulator, which meant that you sat in a trailer because that's when asbestos was all being pulled out of the schools, right? Yeah. Man, are we dating ourselves. So, God, then, you're uh, an old man. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm eight days younger than you are. And uh, there's you sit at a desk right mm -hmm. and they clip on a steering wheel with some turn signals on it and you watch a movie of some dude in a 53 impala cruising around la oh the smith system of driving yeah i don't know totally remember that okay, yeah. Yeah, and when on. he turned you had to like do, do a signal and pretend like you were <laughs> yeah. it was so sad i was just sitting there like is this really it and then we were moving to virginia right after that and i looked into it and if you didn't pass, you had two weeks you had to wait before you could take Ooh. the test again, right? We would have moved to Virginia and I had to start the whole education oh. process over. Well, you saw License to Drive, right? One of the best movies ever. <laughs> okay, we, have on the really, we are really dating <laughs> Corey Hyam or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and he's like, spill my coffee, you fail. You know, that whole thing. <laughs> and he's like, I have to stop on this incline. And the coffee's like just barely lipping over. Uh -huh. <laughs> that was the experience. And uh, anyway, got the license, moved to Virginia, which is amazing now that 16-year-olds uh, really, it's like the third thing on their list. It's the 30th that. thing on their list now. That's I mean, the kid, again, we're sounding like old men, but kids today, they're idiots. Kids today. <laughs> you know, in those roads, there was a lot of jumping going on, and I, <laughs> okay. I was jumping down uh, one road and ended up, uh, the road turned. Mm-hmm. And uh, so my buddy Mike Daniels and I went for a roll. We went seven times back over front. In a Civic wagon? In a Civic wagon. That was, was literally a tin can back in the day. Yeah, it was. You were yeah, lucky you were alive. I saw the roof, roof like coming in every time. And uh, it was through like this insane, you know, and only the way that like a Virginia type of briar bush can be, but mm -hmm. insanely thick thorn bush, right? So the car was kind of cradled a little bit as it was rolling, but it still smashed it all. And uh, and we were all fine, and and it was you know didn't get any tickets or didn't even you know didn't get in trouble or anything except for the fact that I just wrecked my parents' car, and it was uh, it was uh, you need you need that I think as an eighteen year old I was eighteen and what is that is that your way of learning car control <laughs> that was my <laughs> way of learning momentum Pacific. I think <laughs> <laughs> and you got you have to learn the you know the some of the important laws there and yeah. the law of momentum is one of them and they're that uh, I certainly gained a respect for inertia mm -hmm. at that point and um, got a Honda CRX 
uh, after that. So this is you moved to Colorado for university? Yeah. And where did you go? Uh, University of Colorado in Boulder. Nice Boulder. Yeah. And so that was in 91, and that's when people started turbocharging them. Mm -hmm. um, CRXs and Civics. That was kind of the beginning of really mm -hmm. a tuner um, movement here in the States. I mean, obviously not counting hot rodding and everything like that, mm -hmm. but um, from the Honda side of things, that was sort of the beginning. What drew you to Colorado? Did you want to be closer to your dad again? Did you just like Colorado? What was well, the point? Well, every summer and winter since I was three, I'd always gone back mm -hmm. to Colorado. And um, so it was always the baseline home. And, yeah. and as you know, from being a, a military brat, there's sometimes there's, if you if you have family in another place that's always been there and you've always gone to visit, that sometimes thing. is sort of like what yeah. you would consider home because you're just moving around. Yeah. Um, so up there used to be the best kept secret, but the summers in Colorado were incredible. Epic. Yeah. Epic. The summers in the ski mountain are, are better than the winters. I would agree. Uh, it was kind of a no-brainer, and, and I was in, in engineering at the time. That's what I wanted to do, and they had a great engineering school. Well, what did you want to be when you grew up at that point? I wanted to be the guy with the, with the wand, with the little smoke blower, making sure the rearview mirrors didn't have, uh, you know, too many drag-producing vortices. So an aerodynamicist. Yeah, I wanted to be into liquid dynamics and um, aeronautics and, and all of that. That is a very finite goal. That's incredible that you would come up with that at 16 years old. Yeah, it turned out you needed to be at least 65 in order to <laughs> okay. be that guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because it's a lot of seniority and it was a small industry. Yeah. Um, so I went to school uh, as an aerospace engineer mm -hmm. and um, in the engineering program there. And there were only like 2%. I gotta ask a stupid go. question. Were you a good student? Because if you're um, getting into Colorado and getting into aerospace engineering, I'm assuming you, you must have done well in school. My parents said that in order to be able to drive, yeah. I needed a 3.5. And so I got a 3.5003. So they bribed for you. For like two years. Um, yeah. Well, I'd say it worked, obviously. It worked. Yeah. Um, and uh, so it was enough. And, you know, with SATs and stuff like that, I did well. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and then I got fairly good grades. My first year in school and college, I did not. I skied a lot. I kind of had a double whammy saying, maybe you should take a break from school. Okay. Um, my grades, mm -hmm. first of all. And then uh, something that I haven't really talked about before, uh, I think it was around Thanksgiving. I can't remember when it happened, but at some point I uh, was playing hockey in my dorm room. Mm -hmm. and I As ended you up do, with, hockey in your dorm room. That's what, it's yeah. what happens. Yeah. I hit one of those fire sprinklers and I put two feet of water in everybody's rooms. And so I took a break and, you know, had, that was a, that was a, if you can imagine, I mean, it wasn't the first, certainly, but if you can imagine having the conversation with your parents about, I think I'm going to take a break from school and blah, yeah. blah, blah. A lot of kids had to do that. It's not an easy conversation. I can't even imagine, especially it sounds like education was a big thing in your background, sure, in your my, family. My dad's a doctor, you know, my, my mom is a mathematician, and my oh, stepfather is a take it well, did they? No, not at all. So it was... Um, um, Apparently my dad had done it also a little better. He took a break and went moved to Aspen. So that made it a little easier. And I was okay. like, oh, great, I'll go to Vail. I, uh, I got a job as a bus driver there. For Vail Associates? The town of Avon. You know, I had to get a CDL out of it, which mm -hmm. was kind of fun. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you do, you do the air brakes and everything. And those were big buses. They had, you know, the steering wheel here and the oh, front yeah. tires were behind you. And, you know, they were big buses. I wasn't old enough to carry passengers technically, so I was a bus washer which meant that I worked from six in the evening to four in the morning. And I would take the buses once they're out of service and do the route to the bus wash, uh -huh. fuel them, and park them. And it must have been ice station zebra at two in the morning doing this. Oh yeah, so so all the bars would end up at two and then it was all just drunk hitchhikers and you pick them up, of course. Yeah. And uh, it was a big snow year. It was always snowing and I was, really into drifting these buses around. Just glide them in the snow and just Down try to time it six. perfect. Um, whatever the little two lane road yeah, is. Yeah, Highway 6, yeah. yes. And just try to time it perfect so the door would end up, you know, somewhere nearby <laughs> the guy holding his bike walking in the snow. <laughs> and then just psh, open the door and you're like, get on if you dare. And uh, I got fired for doing donuts in the Beaver Creek West lot. Not surprised. Yeah. But it was really fun, though, because you had the front tires behind you. Yeah, yeah. Right? And so when you do donuts, they'd, like, pull you around backwards. <laughs> <laughs> there were four of us on that shift. We all got fired. But And how long did you keep that job for? 
Uh, it was right before Christmas I got mm -hmm. fired, so I made it half the winter. That's pretty good. <laughs> I'm sure your, your father was <laughs> proud. <laughs> My uh, son is kicked out of school, and now he's been fired from a bus driving job. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't remember that conversation, actually. <laughs> probably traumatic amnesia. But yeah. yeah. Uh, but I also washed dishes on the mountain. Okay. And that was a great job. Now actually, where in the mountain? Midvale. Midvale. Okay. Midvale. There's a yep. restaurant at Midvale. Oh, yeah. Right? And so I was the on-call guy just in case somebody didn't show up. So yeah. I really only worked about one day every other week, mm -hmm. and I got a pass out of it, and it was a cook's pass. So, and, you know, the cooks get to go up early to prep the food and everything, mm -hmm. so I could get six runs in before anybody was allowed on the mountain. That is a great scam. It was awesome. Literally was skiing and working. Okay. And then I was doing some continuing education, if you remember what that is. It's like, you know, trying to get my... Um, grades back up basically to get, to back, get back in school. school. Totally get it. Uh, and it was, um, uh, so I was there for one season, but everybody you meet was like, yeah, I just came for one season back in lifers. 72. <laughs> you yep. know? They're lifers. Yeah, and they're there They're for still at the red years. line. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And so I, I knew that that's not necessarily what I wanted, what I wanted to do. And I didn't mm -hmm. want to turn skiing into a job because mm -hmm. I've, I've re skiing was really one of my passions. Mm -hmm. and. My dad was a ski racer back in college, and and so we kind of. That sounds always like a great guy. Nine, up. twelve, a doctor and a ski racer. Good guy. Yeah, he is a good guy. Okay. And so that was, uh, so I did stick to that. Once the season was over, I went mm. back to Boulder to be closer there. I did summer school to get back into school. Mm. Got a job at a car dealership. Uh, you know, washing cars and parking cars. There were two pre-med majors. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, so you wanted to be a doctor at this point, so following in your father's footsteps. I think I had realized that it's not necessarily needed to just pick the the destination. Mm -hmm. I just needed to keep in school and, and figure out what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Didn't necessarily have to say, when I'm 50, I want to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. And then I stayed skiing in the winters, so just not quite as much mm -hmm. during school hours. And uh, I uh, still worked at the dealership. and. I sold a car for a guy named Michael Kitchen, whose dad was an inventor, mm -hmm. and ended up getting a job with a guy, with uh, Bill Kitchen, his dad, and Michael and I were great friends, still friends today, mm -hmm. and um, got a job with the inventor, and, and that's really where things kind of changed for me at that point, because you sort of get that entrepreneurial bug. Mm -hmm. When you meet somebody who just does what they think is the most fun thing for a living, mm -hmm. you think, oh, okay, well, what's the most fun thing that I do and how could I make a living at it? And that, um, so that's really where I started to think about maybe, I wonder what the industry of car racing is like. Now, what were they doing? What was the Kitchen family you said? What were they um, doing? Bill had designed a ride called the Sky Coaster, which was basically like an arch mm -hmm. with the tower back here and you would be in these hang gliding harnesses, you get pulled back mm -hmm. and then you pull a three ring release, which is like a skydiving release mm -hmm. and swing. So it's a big pendulum. Oh, I think I've seen this. One in every park. And then you think, wow, there's baby steps to get there. That's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, was what about Bob? Must have just come out right about mm -hmm. then when they're preaching the baby steps. So it's like, yeah, maybe it's not, you know, an impossible thing to become a race car driver or to make a living with a steering wheel. You just got to figure out how to connect the little dots on the way. Oh. It wasn't a racing beat in our blood with mm -hmm. my family. It just wasn't how it was. And um, But I saw rally racing. I saw some footage. And rally racing, you could see the front tires. Mm -hmm. You could see what the driver was doing mm -hmm. and actually sort of experience like what they were doing as a driver. All the other driving, it just, you know, it, you never really got to see from the outside of the car mm -hmm. what the driver was going through on the inside. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I kind of really liked rally racing and, and remembered watching some of that, not live, but anywhere you could get VHS tapes. And uh, <laughs> we shouldn't say beta. <laughs> um, was because you could sort of experience it. But I, yeah. I never thought that it was a possibility to have the job. Um, and even after working for Bill and, and getting that entrepreneurial bug, it seemed like something worth saving up for, mm -hmm. but I still didn't have enough, there wasn't enough light on the small steps between here and there to really understand whether it was a possibility or not. I understand. A guy named Rich Dahl, mm -hmm. Eurosport, was his uh, racing team, and ended up doing a deal with him that um, I would volunteer on his race team, um, you know, a certain number of days a week, in return, you know, an add up credit to race a car, get a license, do a race. So at this point, had you been doing any racing? No. 
So this was your really your first entree into racing by bartering your time, effectively. Yes, I get my license, my SCCA license, and I do a race in the spec forward, and it goes well, and then just sort of BS'd a little bit, and got uh, uh, hooked into this guy, Jim Christian, who did like the scholarship for mm -hmm. very little money, you could do 10 races with him, mm -hmm. if you, you tested against a bunch of other kids. Mm -hmm. So I did, and won that, and um, that was a great time, great inexpensive way to be at the track, mm -hmm. but it's still big money for somebody who doesn't make a living. Pikes Peak International Raceway had a, an office in Denver, which mm -hmm. isn't that far. Got it. Yeah. So that was my first like sales job, first job not driving something, you know, bus or mm -hmm. golf cart, and uh, it was a great job, and I knew that it would be an, a good opportunity to learn the business of motorsport, mm -hmm. um, why people spend money on a, a sign at the track. And at this point, did your family understand what you were doing, or they were like, "No clue. Why are you wasting your life on this, this racing thing?" No clue. No, they. Uh, it wasn't. You know, it was kind of like. Uh, I think the feeling was maybe you know give it a year or two, and you know then he's going to have to take the MCATs and you know go back to school and. Got it. So they think you're getting your racing ideas out of your system at this point. Yeah. Probably. Okay. Probably. Um, and so that. That job turned out to be good. Um, I did the scholarship and I was at the track and I started kind of a little coaching service at the track. So if I if I qualified like third, there weren't GoPro cameras and stuff like that. So people couldn't really analyze themselves. So having a set of eyes on the track, keeping an eye on, and mostly gentlemen racers, mm -hmm. they're club racing. Mm -hmm. um, to say, oh yeah, I see on turn five, you, could, you got another three feet, you could track out there, that'll gain you two or three tenths, you're missing this apex here, you know. It's, mm -hmm. At that level, the coaching is very similar, brake later, accelerate earlier, you know. And then I just was both feet in. So from that point on, it was coaching in the summer, or coaching in the winters, and then in the summers doing ride and drives, which is like, uh, you know, manufacturer sets up an autocross course. Yep. I worked for BMW quite a bit. They'd set up these autocross courses and give like a two hour racing school, mm -hmm. and you know, you'd be the pro driver sitting in the right seat coaching and that's uh, gotta be nerve-wracking it, it's an exercise in patience that's for sure and it's scary and so yeah. I used to go to those things when I finally got some money to buy some cool cars and I would God, I, I would be feel sorry for the guys in the passenger seat because let me granted I of course I think I'm a wonderful driver but I would sure. see these other idiots yeah. and I'm like oh my god I can't believe you're getting in the car with that guy yeah, there is a lot of I mean, there were premature gray hairs coming out and a lot of instructors <laughs> and stuff. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Um, but it was great because the people you worked with, some of them had really had a great run, mm. and they were just staying active, you know? Mm -hmm. And some of them were just trying to learn the lingo of motorsport. And you know how it is at those things. You're working 15 minutes, you're chatting for 45 with yeah. people in the industry you want to be in. Yeah. And so it was a great education um, there. And, and I was kind of in a weird spot because I had all of the sponsorship contacts from selling sponsorship to a fairly major track for a year, mm -hmm. but no uh, racing credibility or chops or experience at all. And I could slide around an autocross track from all the winter driving stuff, I could mm -hmm. drift stuff, I could do lots of car control type stuff. Mm -hmm. It became very apparent that learning the business of motorsport was really the only way to keep the world going around in, in racing. And so um, I watched many racers from all of those different series that we mm -hmm. had at Pikes Peak International Raceway, you know, come in and talk sponsorship and, and mm -hmm. you know, losing this sponsor, getting that one. Or in, in, so in the winter driving school, um, I started to do some, not just on-track coaching, but also some sales, selling mm -hmm. to oil field services, military special teams, coming up with curriculum. Um, for auto engineers. You know, at this time, stability control and ABS engineers, there were a growing army of them in Detroit. Yeah. And they were essentially, um, the stability control engineers were essentially designing this hand that was gonna grab your car when you got in trouble and yeah. represent the, bait, the best driver in the world to respond to your mistake. But a lot of them couldn't drive themselves, so I would use that kind of disconnect to sell to, to the manufacturers car control uh, classes for those engineers. So you would train the engineers? Yeah, we'd train the engineers just so they at least felt it. You know, felt what it was like. So did you ever go through like these, like GM has the, 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 the class trainings of the different uh, engineers? Like they're like only a couple, handful of engineers can go and take a GM car on say Nürburgring. You gotta be like class six. So we started that with GM. 
And that was a conversation I had. I can't remember the guy's name, GM Wall or something like that. Yeah. His last name was Wall. But um, he had talked about that they were going to start using the ring as mm -hmm. a, a bit of a proving ground. And he wanted to test, he wanted the, his guys to be exposed to things that were out of the box. Mm -hmm. But a couple categories, not just like their, their reactions, um, ability to anticipate, mm. um, and ability to basically uh, think out of the box or learn out of the box, meaning mm. getting, taking any kind of muscle memory or stuff that they have from three decades of driving a car, getting rid of it in order to apply a more proper technique for that surface or that location or whatever, which is a difficult thing. And um, so we would rate the engineers on these different categories, mm -hmm. and then that would determine, because what, because what ends up happening with engineer is, mm -hmm. uh, in a lot of cases, they will say they're working on a minivan, but in the weekends they club race their M3, so they just want they want the minivan to handle like their M3 does. So it really takes uh, the ability to take their own experiences and their own desires out of it. So did you help like craft this this like classification we, system we, with General Motors? Yes, with that uh, classification, I didn't know that it still really existed. Oh, it's a huge thing. Like, there's only like three or four guys that can do it for General Motors. They can mm -hmm. take up. Like, do you see those things like Z06 goes on the Nurburgring, like seven something? Right. There's like three guys at General Motors that can do that. So we, I thought it was pretty early. They may have had a ball rolling of some mm -hmm. sort before that, but um, I feel like we sort of made it up as we went along. So it was probably pretty early in the process. Um, and it sounded good enough to sell it to them. They did it. They sent some engineers out. Yeah. I was working a program in Detroit when it happened, and apparently there was a. It didn't on track. It didn't go that great because they didn't understand how driving a front wheel drive car was going to apply to them racing a Cadillac around the Nurburgring. I understand. But that was the whole point was yeah. to kind of take things out of the box. So some of those programs didn't work as well as others. The the military programs were awesome. Yeah. I mean you'd you'd be doing night vision. Uh, pursuits and using left foot braking to aim an imaginary turret that's on the car, which is interesting because the ice is black and yeah. the snow is green, and so traction basically was green. You'd just try to put the tires on the green bits. I am amazed. How fun is that, right? So fun. I, Dude, I really you have lived on Vale Mountain. <laughs> you lived on a farm in Scotland, and you're training the military to drive at night on ice with night vision. Good that stuff. would be Super a life fun. unto itself, and we haven't even gotten into stunt driving, racing with Ford, Volkswagen, all this other stuff. Oh, you're making me feel very lucky, thank you. <laughs> well, actually, what I'm finding out is this is not luck. It's yeah. all, it, it sounds like, it, yeah, it's a lot of hard work. The one commonality I, I get from me, talking to guys like you, Vaughn, Reese, it's all an incredible amount of work, mm. especially guys that are not going around ovals. It's a tremendous, because they're building businesses, not just the racing part of it. Yeah. And I am floored by this, this mm. military stuff. Uh, the military stuff was fun. One year they brought out Humvees, but it just sort of didn't work. So yeah. we ended up using the school cars. Yeah. And they're the best, honestly, they're the best students the school ever would get. Yeah. Because their mentality wasn't, okay, I just have to be faster than my wife at the end of this three days. The mentality was, this is life or death, in three days, I need to be able to do exactly what you can do, which I know you've spent 10 years learning to do it, mm -hmm. but I need to be able to do it in three days. And and they're, they're so good at just uh, recognizing that virtually every instinct that they have as a human is bad. Mm. Like in almost everything they train in, human instincts are the wrong ones. They have to be replaced with technique, uh, a proper technique, mm -hmm. in order for survival, really. And who were, were these guys that were going to be deployed somewhere, or just special? So there was the North Korea stuff going on, so the winter school got busy around that time. Instead of a word from our sponsors, a brief interruption. As you can imagine, all of us here are incredibly excited about the return of Inside the Moto Man Studio. So much so, we'd like to bring you more guests, more frequently, and in the future, make some of these live town hall events. So to that end, we'd like to ask you a favor. Can you help us get the word out? There are two really easy ways to do this. First and foremost, can you share the show inside the Moto Man studio on your favorite social platforms? That includes Reddit. I would argue Reddit is even more important than the usual suspects. And then second, this is now a podcast. So go to your favorite podcast directory and subscribe, rate, and review inside the Moto Man studio. However you choose to help us, we'd be greatly appreciative. And now, back to this incredible story. When you sit with thousands of people over a number of years, 
and doing, you do a really complicated thing with a real heavy car sliding around on ice and there's all this mysterious stuff going on mm -hmm. and every single human being looks at the exact same little cone or tuft of snow or, or, or does the exact same thing. And with it, like 99% of people do the same thing no matter what you look like or where you're mm -hmm. from. You really learn how deeply ingrained these natural instincts are, mm -hmm. which are great for running seven miles an hour through the forest and missing trees, mm -hmm. you know, at that speed or chasing, you know, wildebeest around, I don't know. But it's not good for driving. This is like a new thing for us as humans. So you have to you have to get rid of all of those instincts that have that that have kept us alive and apply technique that that is not built in. Forget about the car control, you're almost a psychologist at this point. This the biology stuff really kind of connected with yeah. that, which I loved that fact. That that you could be heady about it and um and it's funny because people think of racing as like an adrenaline rush, uh, and it's yeah. the anti-adrenaline rush. Like you, you, you have to avoid adrenaline at all exactly. costs. Exactly. And if you ever let a little drop, that's when it all goes bad. Crash. Learn yeah. that trick from early. <laughs> yes. He's, he is the yeah. ice man cometh. Yeah. He absolutely is. So you, what are you, thirty at this point? It sounds like you're right now. No, right like now, definitely not. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but around this time where you're being a psychologist, a biologist, a, a race instructor, like that. all in um, one. I guess it's more, uh, so this is early 2000s, so yeah, about yeah. 30. Okay. And are you still living in Colorado at this point? Still in Steamboat in okay. the winters and out doing um, drive racing stuff in the summers. Had a had a little bit of a side job in the summer also mm. um, as a sanction, was essentially the sanctioning body, but it was kind of a arranged coaching and, and came up with the rules for a small Formula Mazda series called Rotary Rockets. Just a guy that I had met that had some investor. He bought 10 cars mm -hmm. and he just wanted to run his own series. And at this point, I was kind of like the lead facilitator. So I would do the talking and, um, you know, then we would have certain instructors out. And so I, I wasn't having to sit too much right seat. I was still doing it. But uh, one of the guys, Samuel Hubinet, was like, I'm bailing on Boston. Crazy sweet. Yes. Yes, sir. And he got his name. Drifts trucks or something like that. He got his name, the Crazy Swede, from those ride and drive days. <laughs> okay. When he used to do these demos for BMW ride and drives where we would flip over uh, two cars on outriggers, a Mercedes and a Lexus, and then the BMW would come through without the outriggers kind of a thing, <laughs> right? Okay. It was fairly dramatic, but he got the name Crazy Swede from that one. But uh, he skipped out on work said, you got to get me covered because I'm going to go to L.A. renting a Nissan 350Z and I'm going to enter it in a D1 drifting event. And D1 was the first one from Japan. Yeah. Way before Formula Drift. Right. The guys that I think on the U.S. helped facilitate it with Slipstream, mm -hmm. you know, later went on to form Formula Drift, right? Mm -hmm. And, yeah, I think I said a lot of four-letter words about bailing on work and all that kind of stuff and then um, read up on what he'd done there with some mm -hmm. other co-workers of ours and friends that we still are friends with. Uh, Rich Rutherford, Nick Kuhnwalter, they all shared a car. Yeah. And I was like, wow, that looked awesome. I mean, drew seriously drifting is basically what we do in these parking lots all day. We would set our ride and drive, or like our autocross courses up to make sure that we could drift it in a Crown Vic, uh, which was the round car of choice. So if, when you're in gear, the parking brake wouldn't engage, right? Mm. But you could lock up the tires, it just wouldn't hold it. So you could just kick the brake and you're sideways everywhere, and it was just, it was a great rental car. So, um, Samuel already had all the skills to go do well in the drifting event from mm -hmm. all the playing around on ice and snow that he did in Sweden and then all this ride and drive stuff. So it was a natural shoe in and I ended up getting involved a little later than he did. But it was kind of an easy plug in for a lot of the guys from the ice track days and, mm -hmm. and from ride and drive stuff. And that's where I first got exposure to uh, another level of business in motorsport that really helped kick it into more professional racing. In terms of exposure, were you able to transfer some of the skill of sponsorships to say, hey, okay, I have car control, I've been doing this for 10 years now, there's a bunch of these kids that'll sit in an audience and watch me drift a $3,000 Nissan, can you sponsor me? What happened was drifting wasn't considered a motorsport. No. It was considered a lifestyle mm -hmm. event and a marketing show. And so instead of the motorsport guy from, from a company being there, you got the marketing guy mm -hmm. because they wanted to change the perception of their company and not just, and, and by the way, the motorsport budget was a drop in the bucket to the marketing budget. And everybody was fighting over that little drop in the racing world, but then the marketing guy comes in here and he's got crazy amounts of money to spend mm -hmm. and he knows that 
um, it's worth it to spend a bunch of money to literally grab a young demographic and completely change the perception of their company. The writing was on the wall right away. And uh, I was maybe in that drifting world a little more versed in listening to sponsors and understanding not just, I guess, sales, mm -hmm. but understanding that every sponsor has a different hot button and a different thing. Some want, you know, to eat lunch on the track and have the smoke and everything around, and, mm -hmm. and or and some, um, you know, want television stuff, and some want some, you know, online exposure or whatever. But that was a, a real eye-opening thing from the business and motorsports side, mm -hmm. and that's where I really first made connections with companies and partners that I still have now, actually, sixteen. So what was the first competition for you, and what car was it? First competition, Samuel uh, hooked me up with a friend of his mm -hmm. uh, who had a Supra. It's called Jasper Supra. Love me Supras. And it was, it was not in the series. It was a one-off mm -hmm. that I think Yokohama sponsored, a $10,000 purse. And, or no, $10,000 winner takes all. Mm -hmm. And it was a Laguna Seca. And so I didn't know anything about this. I mean, I, I, it was like down a long 100 mile an hour straightaway into the first corner. Yeah. We're like flicking down the straightaway, I guess, you know, which would be a manji into the straightaway, which was not really a very Japanese style technique mm -hmm. into the first corner. And Reese was there. He had just built a General Motors like factory car. Oh yeah, the Pontiac. Yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, the guy who won it was the only one who really knew what drifting was supposed to look like on the entry was Ken Gushi. Mm -hmm. But I finished third. And for your first Reese. time out. Yeah. So it was Ken Gushi and Reese and myself. And it uh, it was really fun. And I was thinking, really? I mean, we're literally just sliding around, burning tires off of these things. It's and did you make sponsorship money off of that? Did you actually have sponsors that paid you to do that, or you went with your own money? I didn't pay anything for it. So um, you just you got the ride. Yeah. So yeah. your first go, you didn't pay for it, and you came in third behind Reese and Ken Gushi. Yeah, and it was right up the street from my mom's house in Monterey. It was great, right? So everything. Dude, you're the man. It was great. You are the man. <laughs> It was a really cool um, exposure to it, and even though it was a one-off deal, still Ryan Sage and, and Jim Lau were still you know, yeah. promoting it from Formula Drift. And so when they flipped the switch on Formula Drift and got it going, then I really worked to get into a car. And I only was able to do four of the first year's events, um, then did a full season after that. Did you have sponsors? Was it a business, or was it just a ride? Um, I used all the United miles that I'd saved up uh, from <laughs> yeah, you know, Denver, traveling out of course, steam yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and <laughs> so, I used your United <laughs> miles. And so I'd go, you know, go to the events. I'd go to California yeah. for testing. I mean, mm -hmm. I'd get to California in just a few hours. So yeah, I was out there testing and trying to find a team. I went with McKinney. McKinney Motorsport offered to let me drive some. Some of their two, like a Nissan 240. As you do. And D1 was still coming a lot. So yeah. even though you'd only do four Formula Drift events, or you'd also do like three or four D1 events. So I was doing rally full time also at the same time. And so I was, you know, used a lot of United Miles. And then went uh, to a. Um, so AM. when you say doing rally, you're actually competing? Yeah, in um, Rally America. Yeah, Did yeah. that come before drift or after drift? It was the same time. Same exact time. Yeah. Literally and what were you rallying? What, what? A Subaru. Subaru. For the Subaru dealership. So you got a ride again. Yeah, so that was that was a don't have to pay anything. Okay. Um, just show up, but I didn't really get paid. So it sounded like that first half season, a lot of it was it was free. You just it cost you United miles. Basically, United started you. Thank so you. thank you, United yeah. Airlines, basically. <laughs> um, but in that second season, I mean the full season, that's when you started to make some money doing this. With AEM, yeah, it was uh, Stefan Papadakis. Uh, Fellow came, Greek. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah, Papadaki. He came in and he said, hey, so I uh, want to do another car. Yeah. Because yeah. you remember, he came out of drag racing. Too. Yeah. He saw the writing was on the wall. Another guy who sees the business of motorsports. So yeah. Yeah, the writing was on the wall for him as well. And But he also knew that he needed two cars instead of one to really make it work. And so he said, uh, you, you could drift any car you want. Um, we'll build it for you as long as the 350Z. And we'll okay. go. And I was like, all right, that sounds fine. And so uh, he built it, and and we we both really uh, helped drive each other's careers in yeah. in drifting. So was this over four at this point? It must be five. Yeah, five. Four yeah. Or five, yeah. Started going to be an old man at this point. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, getting gray. <laughs> so then I moved to California. Uh, oh, so that's when California. you finally gave up the 
the ice driving ice, yeah. and night vision and yeah. and training Mark Royce on how to drive the the Nurburgring. Yes. Okay. And he is uh, one of like the three guys that Mark. can do the Mark Royce who runs all of product for General Motors for the world. Wow. He's one of the three guys that can do that. Yeah. They did that winter drive thing one one year and yeah. then they nixed it out of their okay. program. Wow. I wish I would have been there when they were Enough there. I think, with them I think they would have loved it. So still doing drifting and rally, I did both of those for seven or eight years. And with Rally, won a championship, drove a number of different cars from Evos, uh, all 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 wheel drive cars, but Evos, Subarus, Hyundai, Tiburon. Right around then, I started a company, mm -hmm. and um, I had established kind of a three legged business. So uh, there was the racing, which was Rally and Drift. Mm -hmm. um, I had just gotten into some stunt driving. I did my first movie in 2005, it was the Dukes of Hazard With Reese. With Reese. He got me on that job. Yep. Um, I had moved into Reese's house in 2005. Uh, so I was his pool boy, basically. It was <laughs> a beautiful house he just moved into. It was <laughs> yeah. Broke-ass broke -ass kid from Colorado. Um, and then the third one well, How'd you meet Reese? Uh, rally. Met him at Rally. Okay. At uh, the Ramada Express Rally in Nevada. Um, then the third one was uh, back when Formula Drift was yeah. on G4 TV. Oh, wow. Uh, a company called WATV produced it. That's mm -hmm. when Olivia Munn was hosting it. Olivia um, Munn. And they were doing another, they did a bunch of other shows, and they asked if I wanted to host a car show. And so I started doing TV for WATV, and that carried on for a long time. And it apparently worked out well for you. It's, yeah, it's working well, and yeah. that, that was it. Uh, by 2006, 2007, that became an, a pretty important part of the mm -hmm. tripod because that was, by being on TV, you could, you know, you would get some jobs from some directors that maybe wouldn't hire you for stunt driving or maybe they were race fans or whatever, or you'd get sponsorship from being on TV or, you know, and it so. Built, it built your brand. It built it, the brand. It helped, yeah, yeah. It helped, helped both of the core things that were really important. And at that point, is that when, was it Ford came along? Ford was a little bit longer uh, after that. Yeah, so after that, I uh, did drifting for a number of years mm -hmm. and won the championship a couple times and went through a, a couple iterations of the cars and the sport was always kind of evolving and moving. Mm. But it felt a bit at the time like living at the ski resort where it, it, was, it was an easy life. You didn't have a lot of weekends, mm -hmm. got exposure to great sponsors. We went to the same tracks, so you didn't have to go test. Mm -hmm. You knew exactly what you were getting when you got there. Um, but y you could get it locked into it. And so I, I saw a video of uh, Marcus Grunholm uh, racing a rallycross car, mm -hmm. a Fiesta, in Sweden. This was really early when GoPro footage wasn't really on very much. Mm -hmm. But I saw a little YouTube video on there and I was like, that looks like about the most fun you can have in a car. Mm -hmm. And at that time I had my manager, which this guy Brian Gale, I said, if we can figure out how to get with Ford or whatever mm -hmm. to do that, you know, I'd put drifting on hold there and I'd go to Europe, do that. It looks like the most fun thing ever. Mm -hmm. And so we started tracking it down. We found out that the Fords were from Europe were actually coming to the US to do Pikes Peak. Cool. And so we met them out in Colorado Springs and we uh, said we'd just like to borrow two cars next weekend for X Games um, after you run them up the hill, if that's okay. And they said, absolutely not, never going to happen. And um, we were, were like, that. Pike Speak is great. X yeah. Games is like so the mothership. Say, you're giving, giving them the marketing opportunity of yeah. a century. I thought so, too. For I was like, free. Look, this is all, these are all the kids that don't want to get the driver's license. you got to yeah. show them some cool stuff, you know? And um, so we raised the money. We had to raise a lot of money in order to rent those cars. Ford didn't own them, to be fair. It was owned by a Swedish company. Fascinating. Uh, Andreas Ericsson. But we raised a lot of money, rented the cars. Um, as part of the rental deal, we had to get their one of the cars filled with their driver of choice, um, the guy who owned them. That was going to be Marcus. He couldn't do it, so he put Kenny Breck in it. Okay. And then we won the, Kenny won the event. I made a really, I literally drove through a hole in the track. Somebody had cleaned a hole in the track and I got lost on the track and <laughs> gave it away. But it was still a great race and the Fords were the yeah. cars to beat, period. 
And the next year, Ford title sponsored X Games. Like they saw the value in it. They got it. And it was a perfect storm. I mean, you had uh, small cars were needing to be cool in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, around the rest of the world, they already were cool, right? Mm -hmm. A two liter car around the rest of the world is pretty high performance. Not here. Um, you needed young people to be interested mm -hmm. um, in, in motorsport. And Ford was just starting to release world cars, you know, where they would release the same Fiesta or whatever the all the way around plan, the world. Yep, the one yes. Ford plan. Mm -hmm. And so they needed to sell like millions of them. Um, and so it, it made sense. So they were really the first that bit the rallycross pitch that we had been giving them to bring the sport to the U.S. Mm -hmm. And um, and they, they did really well with it. Um, <clears throat> a guy who really saw that it was successful uh, for them was a guy named Jos Capito at mm -hmm. Ford. He left for Volkswagen mm -hmm. um, a few years after we got the program going, and then he ended up hiring me at Volkswagen uh, to carry that on. Which answers my next question of how Volkswagen came about. Yeah. So, ag again, understanding, so it's, the, the team in that case was Ford, and they hired you. Did you bring Rockstar, did you bring other sponsors at that point, or did they get the sponsors? It was a little convoluted because we're dealing with motorsports mm -hmm. that didn't exist, mm -hmm. so they had to come up with a new budget. Uh, Ford did, so they we didn't go into the motorsports side of things. We went into a youth marketing budget, mm -hmm. and <laughs> youth marketing. It, it was, uh, and to so make that's cars fly. yeah. The, so that's how Deegan, myself, Ken Block, and Vaughn yep. got involved was through that, and um, and then I would have to do a deal with the team. Uh, with Andreas okay. Ericsson, who's still racing uh, Rallycross here. He, um, he was actually a driver at the time, and now he's just a team owner. So your sponsorship skills that you picked up at Pikes Peak when you were 23 years old were paying dividends for this new business of Fords. For sure, for sure. And I mean, here we got a company like Rockstar, okay? They're old GTOs and Ferraris, maybe, but you want to put a Rockstar logo on a Ford Fiesta? I don't think so. Yeah. You know, it was a tough sell. And then I'm like, trust me, this thing goes zero to 60 in like two seconds. This is a badass racing. It's yeah. going to be awesome. It's going to be all over X Games. So it was a, they, they were, I mean, it was, uh, it's not just like sponsorship skills or something. It was just fortunate that they were in a position where they were trusting enough. Yeah. They never heard of Rallycross, of course. They had never heard of drifting before or, mm. or rally, but to say, you know, to have somebody say, this is gonna be cool, trust me. Mm. I know it's a Ford Fiesta and I know you don't want one, but it's- But this is what, 2008 is when this is happening. Yeah. So the world is uh, falling off a cliff from, a, from the economy perspective. Yeah. People don't have any money and here's an opportunity where they can go and check this out. Like with drifting, you had this pyramid there that you could get on top of when it was small. Mm -hmm and promote the hell out of it, get everybody else to build it up, mm -hmm. and then you're on top of a pretty big pyramid in the you know, motorsports world. Well, Rallycross was the same way. Get on top of it early and, and then do what you can to promote it, and then as everybody else jumps in, now it's like you know, tons of manufacturers, five manufacturers, uh, NASCAR teams like Ganassi and Andretti and oh, all yeah. these other teams, Herda, and they build it all up and you're still on top of it. If, Is there a next thing coming? Like right now you're global Rallycross. I think there is. It's. I think the rallycross hasn't run its course yet. So you're still in it. Yeah. You still see some blue sky in it for you. Yes. And right now it's split a little bit. There's a World Rally Championship and Global Rallycross Championship, and that's. So the World Rallycross um, Championship is in is in Europe and around the rest of the world, mm -hmm. and then GRC Global Rallycross is here in the states. And um, they. Some misleading names, don't you think? Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. But there's. Uh, they tug in at each other. They, they, they ultimately, it's small enough sport and a new enough sport that mm -hmm. it, they help each other by promoting the word rallycross. I get it. Right? But um, eventually it will become mainstream enough that they'll really be competitors. It's chaos. And it hasn't, gr it hasn't matured to the point where it's really kind of clean racing here in the U.S. Yeah. There still is a lot of demolition derby. And that's that's the easy sell is demolition derby, right? Yeah. And you know, it's either easy for organizers to feel like that's what people want. Okay. Um, it's easy to watch, but ultimately in order to be a fan, mm -hmm. it, ha it can't just be chaos. In order to be a fan, there needs to be some racing there. People need to feel like they are invested in the sport and they're educated enough to know that that's a penalty, that's not a penalty. This guy has an advantage, he doesn't. Not just, 
let's throw all the cars in turn one and see which one comes out first. I understand. I will admit, when I first started doing the show, I looked at I looked at drifting as that is I don't understand why people want to do it. Mm. And then I met Vaughn, mm. and Vaughn looked at me and said I was an idiot, and he said uh, you're looking at it the wrong way. You're thinking from the idea of a guy who's going around a track and trying to win a race. You have to think of this as a lifestyle event, as almost figure skating, as it's it's a style, and that's what people are coming to see. And so he took me for a ride, and he told everybody at the Chalk Talk that they were going to go 60 miles an hour into the skid. He goes, for you, we're going 80. <laughs> and then he invited me to, to Formula Drift in L.A. That, this was years ago. Mm -hmm. And that's when I finally got it. I realized that, now granted, you guys have cars that are hundreds of thousands of dollars, but a guy could still get a 240 and go out there and do this. And that's what those the fans were connecting with. And I didn't get it until I went there. For sure. And I was just blown away. It comes back to the natural instincts, the human condition. They're dealing with the same human condition that Vaughn is or anybody else yeah. on the drift track. And you feel it, everybody does, the first time the car kicks to the side. Yeah. You feel the human condition in your responses, your fight or flight responses, try to do the wrong thing. Yeah. And you suppress it, or you don't suppress it and you crash. But everybody had it's not even just a connection of like we're both drifting cars it's yeah. a connection of they understand the skill and the practice that it takes to be able to do it at that level because they've tried it themselves and they felt how wrong we yeah. are in intrinsically how wrong we are inside to, to do, accomplish what he's doing there's a kid in Colorado let's say and he's let's call him 16 years old mm -hmm. and he's about to get his license what advice would you give him in whatever journey he's about to start? Could be he wants to be a race car driver, could he want could be he wants to be a thoracic surgeon. But what advice would you give him being old man Tanner Faust sitting on rocking chairs with an old man from New York reminiscing about R C cars from back in the day? Um, I think I would say to always be a student of whatever you're doing to always be a student. You're always going to school. Even when you're the professor, you have to recognize that you walk away from every single day knowing more than when you showed up. Well, give me an example of, of today. We, we learned how you did that with the racing schools and, and obviously on Highway 6, but give me an example working with, I mean, arguably one of the first families of racing and you're racing this amazing car and inventing a new type of motorsport. What's an example of I mean, my a last student today? two years, I've been studying at the school of driving harder than I had for 15 years before that really yeah and it and partially it's because <clears throat> maybe it's as you get a little bit older you start to get a little more set in what it is you're doing hmm. and um, and I was doing rally cross uh, in Europe where they use a tire where there's a lot of sideways sliding and there's a there's a lot of gravel involved and then coming to the US with a radial tire you basically had to go be a road racer and be very very straight um, with the driving and then I got a teammate of one of the best road racing guys in the world Scott Speed I could always have a little bit on the dirt mm -hmm. and he'd have some on the pavement and then we really started to learn to work together to to make that make us both faster with that mm -hmm. but um, so that meant he had to go to school on the dirt and I had to go to school on the pavement and I've been um, focusing uh, for the last couple of years, turning around. It, it, I, I always thought that because I got a chance to race a bunch of different disciplines each year, mm. that I was a little less, um, I would succumb less to the whole idea of developing muscle memory down one pathway or one motorsport and not being able to jump to another one. But I felt once started racing with Scott and once this series shifted to radial tires, that I was too aggressive. I was pushing tires too hard. Mm. and I was set in my ways and sliding too much. So, man, every single time I'm in the car, I literally have to st stop and start. It's from a standstill, I just, from before I get in the car, I have to do reset and just be like, all right, this is all about inside exits, this is about in, in slow, out fast, this is, I have to go through road racing mentality because if I just go in there and I see the corner, mm. my instinct, even after racing for 20 years, is to stab it in if I feel a little bit of a slide to use it and to mm. let the car kind of work its way out and try to work the tires too much. And so what feels fast 
isn't always fast, and, and I've had to re-educate myself on that. So if I was giving somebody advice, hmm. um, no matter what they were doing, if they wanted to be good at it, it would be to recognize that what they are built with is only going to hurt them. It's the opposite of what they really need for success. What, what the hard wiring that they have as a human is needs to be something that's understood hmm. in order to recognize that it's the opposite of what you want. And um, in most cases, if it's a physical activity that you're doing, mm. the human condition is only going to hold you back. So um, that's why you really have to always be a student of what you're doing and recognize that uh, that you're you're going to class and you need to take each lesson and and get better. You're never you can never just show up and think I've got all the tools built in my bag mm -hmm. and I'm ready to go. On that, man, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. Thank you. Really good yeah, to sit down with you finally and actually chat about all this stuff. Yeah, instead great. Of just you screaming you. in my passenger seat. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, on that note, I say <laughs> bis später. Many thanks for joining us throughout the entirety of this episode. And don't forget, subscribe, rate, and review Inside the Moto Man Studio on your favorite podcast directory. And while you're sharing, how about on your socials as well as on Reddit? Until our next incredible guest, Bis später.